Broadway feet. Broadway makes you want to move your feet. Everybody's dabbing into everything that's happening on Broadway feet. Broadway feet. Broadway feet. Hello, I'm Richard Ridge, and welcome to Broadway Beat, where we bring you the very best of what the New York theater scene has to offer. This week, we look at two new revivals from two of New York's leading not-for-profit theaters. Roundabout Theater Company is proud to present a new production of the Ibsen classic, Hedda Gabler, which is playing at the American Airlines Theater. It stars Tony Award winners Mary Louise Parker and Michael Cerverus. It features a new adaptation by Christopher Shin and is directed by Ian Rickson. But let's start things off at the opening night celebration for Manhattan Theatre Club's newest, the Broadway production of Richard Greenberg's The American Plan, which is playing at the Samuel J. Friedman Theatre, where it's receiving rave reviews. It stars two of the theatre's most sought-after actresses, Lily Rabe and Academy Award winner Mercedes Rule. Under the direction of David Grinley, the American Plan takes place in the Catskill Mountains in the early 1960s, and Lily Adler, played by Lily Rabe, and her mother Ava, played by Mercedes Rule, are spending the summer across the lake from a bustling hotel. When a handsome young stranger, played by Kieran Campion, enters their world, the emotionally fragile Lily finds herself falling in love. But once her imperious mother learns about their relationship, lies are exposed, alliances are forged, and Lily's one chance to escape her mother's control may be lost forever. was um, in the first few years of my career, shortly after getting out of Yale. And it was, uh, it was a work I, I, I used to teach myself somehow to write because I was, I was out of Yale and I was having a career quickly and, and you know, I hadn't really completely internalized my education yet. So I, I became something of an autodidact after having getting my master's. Do you know, and this play was written in um, a way that would um, somehow teach me, you know, because the, the craft of it is evident. It's on the surface. It's, um, you know what I'm saying? It's, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble. Here, yeah. It's interesting because, I mean, I, this play is so beautifully written for such an early play. Because I know, I read something that you had said that you were going to change things when you looked I, at it again. Oh, we did change things. I, there was one, there was one speech that uh, in the first production kept going back and forth between the first and second acts, and uh, it landed in the wrong place. And so I finally got to rewrite it. It was a struggle getting back to it. Rewrite it and put it in the first act where I'd always basically known it belonged. But it was it was one of those sort of, uh, you know, vague things that happens where it just ends up someplace. And that was great because I'd been meaning to do it for years and finally I had an occasion for it. Well, I think it's, a, it's just a... The writing, first and foremost, it always starts with the writing, and I just thought it was a really elegantly written and both, you know, my metier, uh, even in, you know, in a in a show like Journey's End, for example, is uh, shows that have a degree of comedy that uh, in, uh, allow the audience into a show, and then, uh, as it were, once you soften them up, you uh, really twist the emotional knife and take them somewhere somewhere where I, I don't think they were expecting going. And and as I say, even in something like Journey's End, there is a degree of humour that that uh, allows the audience uh, to remain involved in the show such that you can take them to a very uh, deep emotional place at the end. And that's exactly what happens in the American plan. I mean, there's the beginning of both the, the, the first scene and the second scene with Mercedes, that extraordinary speech about all the food. You know, the, the audience absolutely love it, and particularly this audience. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of them, let's face it, were there in 1960 in the Catskills. And, and then it takes you uh, somewhere that I don't think anybody expects and becomes hopefully a, a very moving, poignant and pertinent evening about relationships, about uh, emigration, about uh, about the, the different cultures in this society, and, and fundamentally about uh, two people who, who just try to be together and for whatever reason, forces of nature themselves uh, disallow them to be together. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a story that's very common but very well told and, and is very affecting, and I love doing it. Talk about this wonderful cast you've assembled and the relationship between the mother and daughter. 
Well, Mercedes Rule is, as we know, just a class act in every sense. I mean, having worked so close with Olby, she's, you know, she's really got the chops. And, and what's been great is, you know, Lily Rabe, I've been aware of in the time that I've been in New York. I've been in New York two years now, off and on. And I've been very aware of how Lily Rabe is a, a very up-and-coming actress. And the prospect of putting these two powerhouses together, one who's a very established actress and, a, and another who's really sort of making a name and really coming through, was just too delicious to, to not try and put together. And what's been great about them is that Mercedes sees her role as a woman who's not manipulative or destructive or deliberately malicious, but a woman who's desperately in love, obsessively of mother and daughter. So it comes from a position of care. And I think that's such a fundamental note because it means that everything that Mercedes does, no matter how unnerving for an audience, isn't fueled by cruelty, it's fueled by love. And with, with Lily, what's so great about her is, is her ability to play a, a woman who is, you know, living with an overbearing mother when a, f a father's died early in, in relatively tragic circumstances. And she doesn't give that away too early. She's very good at charting her emotional uh, story such that you don't sort of know the end at the beginning of her story, if you, if you know what I mean. And, and it's brilliant that the, the two of them work so fantastically well together to tell this tale. Olivia, how old are you when it's too late to start being happy? 35. <laughs> I have time. Well, who are you looking for? No one. That boy? He's a man. He has a criminal record. He won't. I made that up. Well, why? It came to me. But you shouldn't speak off the top of your head. I like the top of my head. But it'll get you into trouble someday. I hope so. I love Olivia. Being a companion slash maid might be a little challenging to some psyches, but Olivia is so beautifully written, and David Green, uh, David Grinley, pardon me, has been so adamant about a stillness about this character. It just makes absolute sense, and she just floats above all that goes on around her, and it's very, very. Um, dysfunctional stuff that goes on with the two of these ladies, mother and daughter. But Olivia just inhabits her world. She loves them both. She's very committed to both. And it's just lovely. It's lovely to step on that stage every night and inhabit Olivia Shaw. Well, it's a, it's a, it's an, it's the role that I play is, a, is Gil, who uh, comes in in the second act with his own agenda, I suppose, and uh, sort of mixes things up a bit. Um, and yeah, I think it's a really interesting time in American history. It's uh, it's the 1960s, it's the Catskills, and it's right on the verge of a lot of change uh, that, that happened in our culture that probably would have, um, if that change had come before the beginning of the play, I think it would have gone very differently. So it's, a, it's an interesting time and a lot of interesting themes. I take it you're also fleeing the Circus Maximus over there. Oh, you are at the hotel. For two days. You have my sympathy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, well, I don't have to tell you. Gals in cha-cha dresses, women in mink stoles in what month is this? These foods. We mustn't speak of them. I came here, I thought I was going to relax. All of a sudden, I met these events. I'm doing the hokey pokey. I'm winning sets of dishes in bingo games. I'm watching 50-year-old women in chiffon dresses sing my lord and master into a microphone. It's Nick Lockridge is, uh, has an extraordinary journey. He starts the play looking like someone who nothing has ever happened to, and he ends the play somebody who has been beaten down by life. Um, it's an incredible journey from the sun-swept shores of the Catskills to uh, a beaten down apartment on Central Park West and it's such a joy to get there. And just saying Richard Greenberg's words, talk about that. Well Richard is absolutely brilliant. I wish he could follow me around and whisper in my ear and tell me what to say. Uh, I mean I would do anything that he wrote. He, uh, he's smart and funny. Every character in his plays is smarter than I will ever be. I wish that I had the words at my hand that he gives to his characters. It's, it's absolutely joy to say. So, what brings you to the Catskills? It's my vacation. I'm here with some friends. Why? Uh, it's someplace different. Yes, it is. <laughs> and uh, what do you do um, for work? Oh, I, I'm planning to be an architect. Well, everyone has pipe dreams. <laughs> what do you do at present? 
<laughs> I'm more or less right. I'm uh, more or less a magazine writer at present. Do you more or less write for any more or less specific periodical? <laughs> yes. I write for the Weekly Cultural Epiphany. I've never heard of it. Uh, mostly we spot trends, lionized masterpieces, that sort of the thing. The Weekly Cultural Epiphany. I've never heard I of that. I write for Time. I was so ready for the audience. You know, normally I am I'm so, I'm sort of terrified, but I was so ready ready for them because I think, you know, the, the this play needs an audience. It's it's built for an audience and, and it, it it's built to, to be to be shared and, and to be received and, and so you know that, that first audience it was very exhilarating to, to have to have them there and to and to just you could just feel them leaning forward in their seats and, and it was a, it's a wonderful feeling to, to to feel the play so embraced. Um, Talk about this beautiful role that you play in this wonderful world that Richard Greenberg's inhabited for you. The Lily is um, uh, she's an incredible part. She's very challenging and complicated, and uh, you know all the roles are. Um, I think Lily. Um, you know it's interesting because a lot of the times people sort of say, well, who really is the villain? Who's the victim? And I I, I think you you can't answer those questions because everyone is manipulating everyone. <laughs> Everyone is falling in love. Everyone, you know, but but Lily just she's really trying to um, define herself outside of outside of her mother and and have her own life. It's wonderful, and it's a it's a, a wonderful role. It's something absolutely different from anything I've ever done. I mean, the German accent, the whole, uh, and uh, uh, it's all about language. And you know, the plays that I've done most recently have been Edward Albee's plays, and he too is a great lover of language. He, 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 he delights in language, he savors language, and so does Richard. So it, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to be in a play that is this intelligent and subtle. Talk about the role that you play and how she inhabits this wonderful world that Richard Greenberg has put together. Well, this is a, a, a fascinating woman. She's a, a, it's 1959, 1960, but this is a woman who has survived Germany, just barely got out before the full throttle of the Holocaust came down and uh, closed the last boat and the last uh, airplane out of Germany. And she got out at the very end, very much like Peggy Guggenheim, who I played a couple of years ago, got out at the very end with Max Ernst. And those people who got out at the very end almost got out with their asses singed, you know? And uh, so she arrives in America with some some, some serious uh, sorrow in, in her quiver, you know. But she has a young daughter, and she has a complex and brilliant husband. And how she uh, uh, makes her way uh, through uh, 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 the American post-war scene is uh, one of great cunning. Uh, she's a crafty thing. She's got a sense of humor, and she's a survivor. And so... I, I've, I've had. I'm still discovering things about her. And working with Lily Rave in this wonderful ensemble, you get to work with eight times a week. Talk about that. Oh well, I only wish I had more scenes with Lily. Um, I, I, I find Lily so lovely and so vulnerable and so uh, gentle and so open. Uh, uh, and we have uh, really, really uh, conceived a great friendship between us. And I think it will last long after the closing of this play. I, I have only the most. Uh, uh, I, I, I. She touches me. She touches me very deeply. And Libby Kochstein, using every ounce of energy available to her merely to transport her laden bulk, helped herself not once, not twice, but three times to Napoleon, Saka Tort, and a large plate of little cookies. <laughs> and for ya. <laughs> But my darling, why aren't you eating your breakfast? <laughs> I don't know. Roundabout Theatre Company's latest is their new production of the Ibsen classic Hedda Gabler, which is playing at the American Airlines Theatre. Under the direction of Ian Rickson, it features a new translation by Christopher Shin, and in the title role is Tony, Emmy, and Golden Globe Award winner Mary Louise Parker. Joining her is Paul Sparks, Peter Stromer, and Tony Award winner Michael Cerverus. This new interpretation of Ibsen's modern classic follows Hedda, who is a woman of dangerous independence, restrained by a conventional marriage, and who indulges in a cruel game, amusing herself with the misfortune she inflicts on those around her.
Well, I think that's the question. Why do a play, first of all, why do an old play, but also why do a play that's been revived so many times? I mean, even casual theater goers have seen Hedda Gobbler two, three, four times in their lifetime. So what I thought was, look, let's find what in this play is most frightening to us, most destabilizing, most confusing, and let's start there. I mean, let's try to find whatever speaks to us. Let's not impose anything intellectually or outside into it, but just start inside. So that's all I did. I kept reading the play. I'd sit alone in my apartment and read adaptation after adaptation, probably 20 different versions I read, and each time I would just try to feel the characters in myself as deeply as I could. And that's really where I started, just from a place of emotion. And what a wonderful cast. You worked with the cast very closely. Yeah. Talk about the rehearsal process, and I know Mary Louise Parker had a lot to do with this translation with you and Ian. Talk yeah. about that. Well, we, we worked on it together. I mean, it, you know, it's what's interesting about an adaptation is it's really no one person's, um, because the only person's it is is dead. And, you know, it's... A play is something that happens with actors in front of an audience. It's not something that just happens inside of a writer. So because it wasn't my play, and because it's a play, and we're all collaborating together, it was really everybody's job to, to find out how does this thing work. And that was something we, we all had to kind of be at once very aggressive, but also very uh, respectful. And it's a kind of combination of energy. I mean, if you're going to change something that somebody wrote, you have to have a really good reason. Um, but at the same time, as you're aggressively changing things, you really want to make sure you're respecting what the author's original intention was and also what, what your other collaborators think the play is about. So it was a really, rehearsal process was a really interesting mix of risk taking, of, of passion, but also of politeness, respect, decency. Um, and th I think those were the sort of dominant energies that were conflicting and, and very productive, I think, ultimately. Well, Aunt Yuli, um, I think she's there really to show what Jürgen's early life was like and in juxtapose it to what's the unraveling that's happening now. And I think that's her position, is to give a solid, you know... Um, uh, all loving, you know, all consuming, uh, family first sort of thing, um, and and I think I think that's what she's there for to be the other end of the spectrum, if you will. You have the darker shades in the major characters, but you have something that you can look at and realize that something's gone very very wrong from the point of view of that character and that upbringing and. And uh, it's a nice juxtaposition, I think. Why end things between us? You only have yourself to blame for that. Me? It was you who you broke it up. You know why. What? You know. What? When you forced yourself. I didn't force anything. I gave myself to you. No, Hedda. No. Then why didn't you shoot me? I should have shot you. But you're a coward. Yes, I am. More than you know, Eilert. Uh, I play Eilert Loveborg. Um, well, I'd never seen it. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't really know that much about him. But I did always know that, like, I've heard his name just sort of echoed uh, I love her. And I've kind of been obsessed a little bit with, with who, who this, this person is. Um, I think he's a sort of hard character to play because it's a, like an hour-long drum roll you know, before you show up, and to come out on stage and have to somehow embody this greatness that everyone else has alluded to is impossible. So you have to figure out, like, how do you still fit in there and be human? And I, It's an intimidating role, I think. Uh, but I love him. You know, he's got lots of problems, and um, but he loves hard, and he, he, he thinks hard, and he's, he's, he's a good character. Well, I did the play in graduate school, and then I was uh, I did a production in New York Theater Workshop, <laughs> and so I know the play a bit, but it's like um, a mystery that you really want to come back to again and give it another whack and see if you can actually solve it. Talk about the role that you play. She's such an interesting character, and there's such clarity in this version. Yes. Um, Taya, I, I just tried to think of her as a fighter and as, as a courageous person um, who is impulsive and doesn't really have any plans but has a huge amount of heart. 
and um, that's that's my main take on her. Oh, my dear, don't you have more faith in him than that? The shadow of a woman, a woman, stands between me and Eilert. Well, who can that be? I, a woman from his past. He mentioned her only once, vaguely. Well, what did he say? She's someone he can't forget. The last time he saw her, she tried to shoot him with a pistol. <laughs> no, who would do that? Um, well, I, I had read the play in college, as you know, most people have, I think, is when they encounter it. I'd never seen a production of it before. Um, and to be honest, it, I think that was because I didn't really love the play all that much. The translation I read, um, I just thought, well, she's just a bitch. He's, a, you know, he's a wimp, and you know the other. And I just didn't really see that it had a lot to say to me. Um, but Christopher's adaptation makes it so, it's like strips away all of the the politeness and the the ornamentation that a lot of other uh, adaptations have, and and just kind of gets at the meat of these people who all of whom are trapped in their circumstances, all of whom are, you know, desperately trying to to preserve their what what they have, or you know, they're terrified of losing what they might have. Um, they're jealous of each other and trying to you know, but also trying to behaved honorably or nobly, at least in my character's case. Um, and and all of that makes it feel very vivid and real and, and gives me a lot to play in a part that ordinarily wouldn't be the part that I th that people would expect me to be playing, um, which is why when Ian asked me to do it, I thought, I have no idea what I would do, so I'll have to do that. And um, I got, kind of regretted that decision at <laughs> points in rehearsal, but... Um, but I'm now really, you know, so happy that I have. And, and it's been thanks to Chris's advertisement, Ian's guidance, and this company that, that I've been able to find a version of, of this character that made sense for me to be doing and that I think kind of helps Hedda seem... Uh, I, I think Tessman being a, just a wimp and a doormat undermines Hedda, and I think... If, if he has more of a spine and, and actually is some, some kind of alternative for her, I think it makes her dilemma and her, you know, her tragic choices that much more painful. Because I was born in Sweden, I still have the language, and I can read Norwegian. And um, being a young actor in Sweden, you grew up with Ibsen and Strindberg. And they, are, they have a very similar way of writing. And, and Ibsen has been sort of, and even Strindberg, they've been modified over England, the Victorian England or Edwardian England, and they become, you know, it's pretty peculiar instead of saying it, it's weird. <laughs> it's pretty peculiar. And, and um, we have tried to find a language and also that is more close to Ibsen maybe than, than usual translations are because they become very flowery and sort of it's too many words sometimes. We try to scale it down to the bones and I think Chris has succeeded a lot and he's been, um, not only by me, he's been, you know, screamed at sometimes, look at this, look at this, but also from other actors with other translations. But it's hard to find the core of Strindberg, oh, it's hard to find the core of Ibsen and I think he, he's the one who's gotten the closest. Talk about the translation and what you wanted to bring. I was really interested in going back to the literal translation because, oddly enough, some of the translations, like the classic Oxford, they're a bit more diluted than you would think. His, his in some ways, is more shocking. Some of the things he wrote, even though he wrote them back then, were far more shocking than, than some of the English translations will will show. So I wanted I wanted it to be as bra you know as bracing and as um, stark and as human as it could be and, and I think that I found that going back to the Norwegian I found some things that I thought were really interesting. And it's so contemporary this was the most clear and literal I've seen so many Hedda Gabblers and this was so clear but yet contemporary did you want that feel for it all? I just wanted the emotions to be contemporary without the dialogue being colloquial at all I didn't want you to feel like you were watching people talking on the subway or do you know what I mean I wanted to be true to the time so that it wasn't it wasn't incongruous, but I still wanted the emotions to feel 
modern so that people could connect to it. I think Ian Rickson is one of the finest directors we have working today. What was the whole rehearsal process like in creating this with your director? It's really with the actors, I feel like, that, um, and he's, you know, of course, a, an amazing, wonderful man. But the actors really fed my performance, and they continue every night. I feel like, you know, Anna, there are so many moments that I don't have to do anything. I just have to connect to her, and she just feeds me. And, you know, same with, um, with Paul, every single one, Peter and Michael. Everyone just feeds me so much. So I feel like they taught me, and they gave me my character. My final question is, you've done a lot of not-for-profit theater, and it's so important to New York. What what that means to you, not-for-profits, and roundabout in general? I just want to do theater, period. I would do, do it in the grocery store. Okay. Um, yeah, it just... There are theaters that I'm really familiar with, and the community and the people. I've worked at Manhattan Theater Club a, a gazillion times, and um, Playwrights Horizons. And it's just, it's just where I'm happy. It's just something that I belong to, and I'm, I'm so happy to be there. It's like the only place in the world I can say that, other than with my kids, that I feel really at home. We have the home we both dreamed about. That we would receive guests. Yes. Well, from now on, we'll only have each other for company and. Aunt Eula over once in a while. Hedda, you deserve so much more. So, now I can't have my own servant. Keeping servants, we can't even think about that. And the horse I was promised. The horse? Oh, I dare not think about that either. Good Lord, that goes without saying. Well, at least I have one thing to cheer myself with in the meantime. Well, thank God. What is that? My pistols, Jurgen. Your pistols? General Gobbler's pistols. Dearest Teddy, you promised me you wouldn't touch those dangerous things. 